Hi, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and Podcast. I am thrilled to have Dr. Brooke <laughs> Kalanak, who is known as Dr. Brooke alone. She's a naturopathic physician and a women's hormone expert. Dr. Brooke, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I am very excited to talk to you because I have had many questions over the last couple of months from Wellbe community members and private clients who are experiencing challenges with allergies and histamine issues, and they're going to conventional physicians who are telling them they just have histamine problems, sort of in this like blanket, like you can't do anything about it kind of a thing and not really going upstream (laughs) to understand what that's related to or why that might be happening. And so they just go on prescription or non-prescription antihistamines. And so, you know, people that don't want to stay on a drug forever or want to understand root causes often talk to holistic patient advocates or seek advice about which direction to go in next. And I want to make sure that I fully understand it because it's a super complicated topic. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So you, as I mentioned, are a naturopathic doctor with a master's in acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine. I believe you were also on the path to become a conventional pharmacist before that. So before we get into all the details about histamines, what was it that first sparked your interest or made you decide to go into this specialty and functional medicine in general? Well, or probably like, medicine yeah, in general, I should say. <clears throat> yes, I was that before functional medicine was a thing. I've been doing this longer than I realized. So I know. I feel like quite, I just it's graduated. Quite a new subset in the world of holistic medicine and integrative medicine and all the words that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, as a naturopathic doctor, the functional medicine model really fits with our tenants and our principles. So it was kind of a natural uh, way for me to continue to study and and end up practicing. Um, So yes, starting off as a pharmacist, I was like many pre-med students, so a little bit unsure what track I would take, um, but knew that it was probably something in the health field. And then I applied to pharmacy school much earlier than I thought I probably should and didn't think I would get in, but it was really competitive and everyone said, just get started. Well, I got in. And so I wasn't like sold on the idea that that was for me, but I went ahead and went down that path. And probably like many of the people you've interviewed, my own health started to go wonky and I didn't know what to do. And my conventional answers just weren't really working for me. So I was diagnosed at age 16 with PCOS and just told, here's the pill, come back when you want to have a baby, you're probably going to be infertile and um, have diabetes. And that's We'll see you then, which, you know, you're 16. So I was given the pill. I took it and, you know, I never did well on it. I would kind of always take myself off because I just didn't feel right on it. Um, but I didn't have, you know, when I would come off of it, all the PCOS stuff would come back. I'd be breaking out. My cycle would disappear, just all of that. So there was no good answer and found my way to my own naturopathic doctor who at the time, it was funny, what she did for me was so simple. She helped me stop over-exercising and do things a little bit differently, I focus a little bit on my sleep, on my blood sugar. I ate a little bit better. I think she gave me some B vitamins and some adrenal support. And my life was transformed. Like I wish all my patients were that easy. So having been helped by her a couple of different times, I ended up sort of jumping ship as right as I was getting done with school for pharmacy and going to best year in Seattle. And so knowing that I wanted to do, you know women's health, partly because I had dealt with my own hormone issues. I want to make sure that, because there's a whole bunch of different kinds of people that listen to this, the best year is a top naturopathic uh, medical school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's one of, yeah. And it was luckily I lived in Seattle. So I went to the one that was close, but yeah, that was um, the second one in the country. I believe we have four or six now. And yeah, at the time it was great because it was local. I didn't have to move. I grew up in Montana, lived in Seattle. And so this wellness and naturopathic medicine and naturopathic doctors there are fully licensed primary care doctors. And that's how I was trained and we can prescribe and order labs and do all this stuff. Then I moved from there to New York city, which was a whole different, like it's, you know, I have a master's in Chinese herbs, which I don't use because I moved to New York city and I'm trying to get my New York city patients to take these foul tasting Chinese herbs. And they're like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. For the record, <laughs> that's one of the like five modalities that helped me to reverse my chronic Lyme when I was a teenager, because my mom was very interested in all kinds of things and was willing to do whatever works. So we would go to this Chinese herbalist in Flushing and the uh-huh. teas that he made us drink. I mean, our house, I think I did throw up a few times. I mean, they're really gag inducing. Yes. Um, yeah. But I got better. I don't know how much of that played a role, but they are quite powerful. So they are. Uh, 
if, if I think my niece, who their doctor suggests it, think hard about it because yes, it's gross, but they're very powerful and effective. Yeah. My New York patients were like, can you put that in the capsule? I will take it, but they're not going to cook these teas that make the whole apartment building smell like Chinese herbs. But yeah, so I sort of found my way based kind of on my own journey and um, kind of pulled in um, strength training and exercise as a big part of what I do. So that wasn't necessarily planned. That just ended up being something doctors are always telling your patients, like you need to exercise and eat better, but they weren't giving them any advice on how to do that. So that became a bigger part of, of what I do. And so now I feel like my practice is, it is very holistic. We do all the functional medicine stuff, but really focus on stress management and how you're exercising and how you're sleeping and all of all of those good things. So um, it's been great to have, I guess, kind of solved some of my own problems and ended up with a clear path of where I was going to go. That's awesome. Ed, like you said, so many of the people on this show <laughs> and myself came into this from personal experiences. And I appreciate that because it takes somebody who was thinking one way to change their perspective and think a different way, which just immediately, it just means that you are not a dogmatic person who will stick to one school of thought or a closed-minded person because you want to believe it so badly. You will consider other ways of doing things. Um, and I just think that's a great quality in general. So I always welcome those people into this show and into the WellBe community. I do want to make sure we get into histamine stuff because I'm yeah. so interested and I have thousands of questions and we'll <laughs> get mm -hmm. to a few of them. Can you explain what exactly histamines are and how they connect to hormonal health? Because I know you actually specialize in women's hormonal health. What's the connection there? Yeah, it's funny because now histamine intolerance is talked about a little bit more. So I do get the occasional person who reaches out to me saying, I have histamine intolerance, I need your help. But most of them don't, right? Most of the women are reaching out to me and they've got fatigue, a thyroid issue, not sleeping, any sort array of female hormone issues, maybe some digestive stuff. And what we find when we start talking to them is based on some of these symptoms, histamine is one of the things that's often linking them all together. And I'll talk a little bit about why, but histamine is a, what we normally think of as, you know, allergies, right? So you, runny nose, um, seasonal allergies, maybe a food allergy, but most of the time people are thinking of like the runny nose, itchy, watery eyes. And that is a histamine based process. That's not the same as histamine intolerance, which is what I think a lot of people are starting to wonder. And they read more about like, should I be eating these certain high histamine foods? And where is this coming from? Is it my gut? How does that relate to my hormones? So histamine is part of your immune response. It's part of your inflammatory response. It's one of the things that like you think about a hive, that's a pretty classic histamine example. There's some sort of insult there, whether it's a cut or um, some sort of allergen, right? And you get in a, that allergic hive, it vasodilates. So you get all that fluid rushing there. So it brings immune cells. It's one of the things that kind of like recruits the white cells, like come to this area and deal with this problem. So it's really important as part of our normal immune response and part of our allergy response. It also does a bunch of other things. It's a neurotransmitter. It's part of some, your wake sleep cycle. If you think about certain antihistamines make you sleepy, it's because they block histamine in your brain. Um, so there's different histamine receptors throughout your body, but that's one place that it works. It is important in stomach acid secretion and gastric motility. It's important in uterine contraction. It um, has a relationship with some female hormones that I can get to in a moment, but it's also part of like sexual arousal. And there's just all of these things that, that it does. So it's a really important neurotransmitter. It's not really a hormone. It's more like a neurotransmitter in some cases and an immune mediator in other cases. So it's sort of stored in these cells called mast cells that are all over your body. You know, you have them a lot of times like in your joints, you have them in various different tissues. They tend to be found like where you meet the outside world, like your gut lining, your lung lining comes in contact. I was about to with... say people that ask me questions about histamine stuff usually say that I'm on a mast cell stabilizer. I'd like to not be, you know, how do I so solve this problem more naturally or holistically. So that's to me, I, I picked up on that. I'm like mast cell histamine. Yeah. They all come together. And there's sort of a couple different ways you can be histamine intolerant. So allergies, like if you're someone who's like, well, I just have seasonal allergies or I have dust allergies. Does that make me histamine intolerant? That is a histamine reaction. Now you could, depending on other factors in your life, be more histamine intolerant and have trouble processing histamine and maybe you're okay most of the year, but it's worse. Like you, all of a sudden you can't tolerate as many foods as you used to and stuff. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but that's, that's kind of that true allergy picture. And then we've got what people are talking about now, which is I'm 
I think I have histamine intolerance. I have unexplained hives sometimes. I'm just generally kind of itchy. I've got a lot of GI issues, uh, you know, that I'm having issues with um, insomnia or irritability. And I read that that could be histamine intolerance. So again, that's a little bit different than what we call a classic allergy. When we talk about histamine intolerance, there's a couple of different things that can happen. And some of them involve the mast cells and some not so much. So histamine intolerance is you are releasing too much histamine or you can't process it properly. So sometimes people will find like, I went on this healthy diet and I, I went on a whole 30, right? I went on this great diet. I started eating kombucha and sauerkraut and tons of avocados and all of these healthy, but high histamine foods and their symptoms flared. So that's one issue, or somebody just has like a chronic ongoing inflammatory or immune or infection kind of burden, which could be, you know, you mentioned Lyme, uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, different H. pylori, lots of different gut infections, or even just general dysbiosis. Some of those like ongoing things, or you have like an ongoing chemical exposure, or your detox is just not up to snuff, and you're not able to clear histamine out. So you can either have it as like, it developed when I made this change or I moved or I got exposed to mold or I got this infection. We're seeing some more histamine intolerance with people post COVID. So sometimes you get an infection that triggers this. Sometimes it's just this ongoing accumulative sort of immune burden that triggers some of this. And so you have these, you know, various symptoms. Yet another- I, I was just about to say the people I know I'm thinking of um, that have been diagnosed with histamine intolerance or take a mast cell stabilizer from their conventional physician have SIBO, have Lyme, yeah. have a couple of the things you already mentioned. Yeah, That makes sense. So we'll get back to kind of like what we need to kind of address those root causes. And then the kind of the third way, which happened to be what I had uh, when I was dealing with this is that you just have some genetic SNPs. You don't process histamine properly. Now, remember genes are just one part of the equation, right? We've got a gene that might predispose you to this, but if you can clean up your diet and lifestyle, then those genes are not going to be such an issue for the most part. So there's various enzymes in your body that clear out histamine. We've got DAO enzyme, DAO in your intestines. We've got um, HNMT um, and we've got NAT2, which is more in your bladder. So you've got like ways that your body tries to get rid of histamine. And if you have any issues with those, like I have double SNPs in two of those and uh, one polymorphism in the other one. So like, I have a lot of ways that if my histamines get high, I, I don't clear it very well. It's so that's kind of a third way that people understand that when you say a double SNP for DAO, so DAO yeah. is a genetic. Well, well so this is confusing because the enzyme and the gene have the same name. So there's an okay. enzyme DAO and there's a gene for DAO. And so your genes make the enzymes. They tell your body to make that enzyme. So if you have an alteration in that, you might not make as much of that enzyme. Or maybe you make plenty of it, but you're eating a ton of histamines and now that system is bogged down or you've got other compromise in your histamine clearance and your genes are fine, but your, got it. Well, your I will diet and lifestyle. A profile of my genes from a genetic genie, you know, dot org or whatever. Yeah. I, I'll be looking at that as soon as we get off. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I will mention 23andMe because most people get that one. Um, the 23andMe data right now is not including most of the histamine genes. So okay. don't run out and get that one. Um, well, never mind. Well, the only way you have to upload your, <laughs> your 23 uh, me. either ancestry or 23andMe data to Genetic Genie, which is like a free service. So I uploaded my 23andMe. So never mind. I won't be looking at it. If you got it done several years ago, like more than five years ago, it was on there, but lately it's not. I'm not I don't oh, know. Oh, okay. It um, was done quite a long time ago. Okay. Well, so. you might still have those. So you can check and see if you have like how much Dow do you normally make? Now there's a lot of other things that can impact that. So let's go through the symptoms real quick. Cause again, they're kind of all over the place. And it's one of those things where people will look at this list of symptoms and sometimes they see themselves like they have all of those and like, okay, I really have a lot going on that histamine is impacting and it's making it worse. Some people are like, I just have this one. So it can't be that it's not really like that. It's, you don't have to have them all. And there's certainly other things that can cause some of these things. So it's not always histamine, but it is certainly when you see it in a lot of places, you're going to want to be thinking like I should investigate why am I having so much trouble with histamine? And then this is all histamine intolerance. We'll talk about mast cell activation, which is a bit of a different thing. So when you think about histamine related symptoms, you can have, again, so many things, so much stuff with gut. You can have reflux um, or GERD. You can have issues with you know loose stools and cramping. You can have more painstral menstrual cramps. You can have an irregular cycle. You can have breast tenderness. 
You can have a lot of mood stuff when it comes to like irritability, fatigue. What doesn't cause fatigue though, right? Like pretty much everything that we talk about could be fatigue, but insomnia or agitation, especially like if you ate a high histamine food, like that was sort of how I was discovering. And if I had higher histamine foods for dinner, I was just anxious and couldn't sleep all night when I was kind of at the peak of mine. And of course, lots of skin rashes. So any kind of itching that's unexplained, it kind of comes and goes. And part of the thing that people find so frustrating is it gets sort of confused. It is so tied to gut, like we were talking about for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of those infections like SIBO kicks off a lot of histamine. So it's one of the ways you might have more histamine in your system because these bugs are are making it. And then maybe you can't clear it as well, right? So when you think about where does this stuff come from? So gut health is really, really important. Another way that it's important is enzymes like Dow are made in your, they're in that intestinal lining. And so if you've got a lot of inflammation because you're eating foods that bother you, or you've got dysbiosis, you don't have a healthy gut microbiome, then you can end up with, you know, especially with SIBO, just kind of damaging that lining a little bit. And then those enzymes aren't going to work as well. So you can get a whole host of symptoms. Again, you don't have to have them all. And histamine is not the only thing that causes menstrual cramps, right? Or breast tenderness. Like it, there's a lot of other things things that can cause these things, but it's a really, really common issue. Why is it so common now? Well, our guts are oftentimes not as healthy as we need them to be because of medications, environmental stress, our food system, a lot of our own like psycho-emotional stress. Um, We also have just an increased burden in our environment. So our liver just has to work a little bit harder to kind of process a lot of things. And that can be another thing that really creates this, you know, histamine intolerance. And then of course we might be eating a lot of those foods. Like who's not eating avocado, right? They're good for you, but it's a high histamine food. I was going to say, before we move on to the mast cell stuff, you have to give us a couple examples of high histamine foods. Cause I don't think I know those off the top of my yeah, head. Yeah. I mean, the biggest ones, anything fermented or aged. So all the, the kombucha, the sauerkraut, the kimchi, all that stuff we're telling you to eat for your gut. And it is important for your gut, but if you have an underlying histamine intolerance or you're dealing with some of that, it might not be the best way for you to get your probiotics or we can fix the underlying cause. And then you might tolerate those better. So that's, that's interesting because those, those foods are also problematic for people with SIBO, but yeah, like yeah otherwise are fantastic for gut health. And and we know now you just explained that histamine and SIBO are connected. So I wonder if it's, Mm -hmm. it's not the SIBO that might be making you, you know, not do well with fermented foods, but in fact, the histamine behind the SIBO or something like that. Or the histamine because of the SIBO in that case. Because of the SIBO. Yeah. So those bacteria will produce more histamine and then your body has to deal with it. Got it. Yeah. So you want to clear the histamine when it comes to histamine intolerance, so much of it can be resolved with a healthier gut. Not all but some, like for me personally, I have to have a healthy gut. I have to have healthy liver detox, but I also have these like genetic issues. So I still can't eat like two avocados in a day or I'll be itchy the next day. I can't do collagen. I can't do, there's a couple of things like that that really kind of fire me up. So some of the foods, so again, the high histamine foods tend to be aged and fermented. So there's, um, you know, all that stuff I just mentioned also like aged meats and cheeses. Those, you know, some people may not be eating those because they're not eating dairy, but those are also really higher histamine foods. They also have other things in them like tyramines and some of those other that age Aged food is interesting because a lot of those components that happen when we, aging is essentially rotting. Um, A lot of those components go fight for those same enzymes. So things like aged cheeses are even worse for me because they've got tyramine and histamine, and I've got all those slow enzymes that need to deal with it. So the fermented foods are kind of a biggie. Certain good greens like spinach is a high histamine food, avocado, shellfish, a lot of um, dairy grains can be higher histamine, nuts, not all nuts. Like there's sort of some argument about what nuts are okay when you're doing a low histamine diet. If you guys start Googling low histamine diet, you're going to get a whole variety of different lists. My list that I give out tends to be in the middle. You have to eliminate enough of it to get some relief. If you're going to try a low histamine diet, which we should talk about as kind of a good diagnostic tool. If you can get some relief and still keep some of them in, sometimes that's a little bit better. The low histamine diet, ironically, is terrible for your gut. It's not very diverse. We took out a lot of vegetables. We took a lot lot of, because they're high histamine, and we took out all those fermented foods. If you're going to go on a low histamine diet, um, I guess we're kind of talking about that now. It's a great diagnostic tool. If you take all those foods out and all those symptoms go away, you know you're having some sort of histamine intolerance. Now, 
you can't live on that diet forever. It's incredibly restrictive. It's overall not super healthy. Now, some people do have to return to it from time to time when their histamine intolerance is at it, you know, it's flared up, but it's not really something we'd want to keep you on unless we have mast cell activation, which I'll talk about. We'd want to like fix those underlying causes. Can we support liver detox? Can we spruce up those enzymes? There's a lot of cofactors for those enzymes like copper and um, B6 and B5 and your methyl donors like B12 and folate. You say cofactors for those enzymes. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, so an enzyme is this protein that's going to do some work, right? It's going to turn this this chemical into that chemical. And it usually needs some sort of help, some sort of cofactor. And it's almost always magnesium and a B vitamin or some sort of mineral and a B vitamin. So for example, Dow needs copper and B6 and some of those other enzymes. And I mentioned HNMT, any enzyme you hear that ends with an MT, you guys might've talked about COMT at a time, anything that ends with that needs those folate and B12. It's a methyl transferase. And that, if you guys have talked at all about MTHFR and some of the issues people have with some of those genes and some of those enzymes, you know, that impacts so many other things. Histamine is certainly just another one of them. And so, MTHFR gene has come up a couple of times and it's one of those well, if somebody doesn't know much about how their genes impact their- They know that one. <laughs> I guess they know that one. Actually, a lot of people don't even know what it means they can't do. They're just like, oh, right. I have the MTHFR gene. Like I'm compromised. And you're like, right. but how do you know? And actually, are you just a little compromised? Because you only have one, you know, it's heterozygous or yes, not homozygous. Or do you have both? And therefore it's like more of an issue. And it's, it's a very complicated, confusing topic. But I think the main- takeaway with regard to histamine is that? So when you think about histamine, the best analogy is a bucket. All of our stuff that gets cleared, you know, you've got a flow coming in and then the drain coming out. The drain coming out is your enzymes, it's usually liver detoxification or some way that you're moving that out. So you can have too much coming in. So let's say you've got SIBO. So you've got these bacteria in your gut that are making more histamine. Plus you're trying to be good and you're eating your avocados and you're eating, you know, spinach salads and you're, maybe you're eating your fermented foods or and so you might not be if you had SIBO, but if you have, you know, again, some sort of gut based infection or even chronic infections like Epstein-Barr some of, and who knows, maybe COVID, like again, some people are getting histamine stuff triggered all of a sudden after they've had COVID. So certain infections could increase your histamine production. So that's what's coming into the bucket or you're eating a lot of those foods, right? Again, most of them, most of them on that list are healthy. Lemons are on that list. Um, tea. Um, so you might be having a lot of stuff come into your bucket and then you need to make sure that you can clear it out. So the easiest thing with to kind of know if this is you is to stop the flow coming in. So if you can decrease those foods for seven to 14 days and you feel much better, you kind of dumped your bucket essentially, right? We can also like spruce up how you're processing those. Like, can we give you some of those nutrients? You can actually take Dow enzyme. They sell it in a capsule. It's rather expensive. So it's not a really great long-term solution, but it can really help people like, like me, if I'm going to eat an avocado, I take that because it just helps because I don't make a lot of that one. Right. So you can, kind of decrease what's coming in and you can enhance what's coming out. And that will help histamine intolerance. So again, the testing for it, we should talk about that. Cause I kind of use the low histamine diet as a diagnostic test. If you decrease those foods and you feel better, you stop itching, your anxiety gets better, your insomnia gets better, your skin clears up, your joint pain goes away, your digestion is better, your acid reflux is better. Then we know you've got some sort of histamine intolerance. It does not tell me where what your root cause is, but now, you know, like I need to investigate some of those root causes that we just talked about. And a healthy gut is always the place to start because it's going to impact really truly everything. And for a lot of people, that is their root cause. I would say the next one is probably sluggish liver detoxification. And when we talk about the genes, I just, and MTHFR is a good one, a good example. I just want to make sure everybody knows that just because you have this gene does not mean that you need to take this supplement. And just because you have MTHFR does not mean that you have to always be on folate and B12. You want to use like real-time testing as well, like looking at your homocysteine or your methylmalonic acid or some of those blood tests we can do, or there's urine organic acid tests. You want to match those, right? You don't want to just take it because you have this gene because some people have the gene, like there's other people that have 
low, you know, maybe they have the same SNPs as me with Dow, but they've got so much other good stuff going on in their diet and lifestyle that they're not really impacted by that. They might be at a time, like my histamine tolerance only popped up when I was under a huge amount of stress writing that book. <laughs> so when we was writing angry is when all this stuff was really like coming up for me. And I'd never really had it before, except for one other time I had some unexplained hives also a period of high stress. And then it went away. And when it comes to like that and with the food, I think it's really frustrating for people because they're like, am I sensitive to an avocado? Because sometimes I eat it and I feel fine. And other times it flares my symptoms up. And that's because of that bucket. Like if you, maybe you had a lot of other high histamine foods leading up to that day, you ate the avocado and it tipped you over the edge, or maybe like me, you had so much stress going on. So you were depleting some of your other nutrients and your inflammation was high. And then now all of a sudden all the histamines can, can build up. I was just going to say my husband uh, dealt with some acid reflux, heartburn type symptoms. And we had a, we have a great interview with Dr. Jonathan Aviva on this, um, which people continue to love and find, even though it was a couple of years ago, but it's the same bucket idea, I think. And now that you explained the histamines connect to reflux and GERD and things like that, it makes even more sense to me because he's only really experienced severe symptoms when he's been having, you know, a lot of coffee with a lot of wine and a mm -hmm. lot of citrus fruits and things that we know contribute, but it doesn't. And that's a, that's one of those histamine receptors. That's the H2. When we take things like Prevacid and Zantac, those are H2 blockers. They block histamine in your gut. Oh, interesting. So that's okay. why they work <laughs> because so histamine those... mediates acid secretion in your stomach. So that's okay. one of the reasons. So those conditions, it's funny. I always said the root cause of acid reflux and heartburn are eating too much of these things, but I actually, that's not really the root cause because eating too much of those things, if you didn't have these other histamine issues, you'd just be eating a little too much of those things. I've never had an acid reflux symptom. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly had lemon water in the mornings and coffee in the morning. And yeah. maybe the night before I had red wine. So I could easily, but I've never. And so I think that means that he might have more histamine yeah. issues. Than or I maybe he has uh, H. pylori or he has something else going on in his gut that's making some histamine. And so it's making it harder for him to deal with. And stress in the gut are so tricky, right? Because if you're more stressed, you have less, you know, nervous system input into your gut and you make less of those enzymes and that there's a little bug in there, then that's going to contribute too. And then sometimes we gravitate towards foods that are not the best for us when we're under stress too. And that it all gets complicated, but yeah, it's so a bucket for sure. I have a question about the difference between straight like food allergy or food insensitivity versus histamine intolerance, or even just what would you say is having too many histamines or something? Yeah. And this is a good question. Cause I think people are starting to say like, oh, I have all these food sensitivities. I must have histamine intolerance. They can go together, but they are not necessarily again, the same thing. So a true food allergy. So the kid that can't come near the peanut or the person who gets breaks out in hives when they eat shrimp or lobster or a strawberry, that is more a true food allergy. And that's mediated by something called IgE. That is a very specific, true allergy part of your immune system. Food sensitivities are not mediated by histamine. So they're mediated in more like different part of your immune system, different immune globulins play a role in sensitivity. It's not that I eat the strawberry and get the hives right away. It's that I eat this food and the next day I have a stuffy nose or the next day I have a headache, or maybe I have tummy upset from that. It's more of that delayed sensitivity reaction. So they're not necessarily the same thing. So again, you might eat the avocado one day and you're fine. And then you eat it another day when you've been under stress and maybe you had a shrimp and spinach salad the night before and then you had some wine, wine's another high histamine because it's fermented. Your bucket that day was full. And this frustrates people to no end because they're like, no, no, I'm not sensitive to avocados. I had one yesterday and I was fine. But it, again, like where was your bucket that day? And I'll talk about how that relates to women's hormones too because that plays in too. So it's not the same as a sensitivity. Now, someone who has a really unhealthy gut could have histamine issues because the bugs are making histamine or because they've got inflammation in their intestinal lining. And so they're not producing the right same amount of those enzymes. So you can get more food sensitivities when you have dysbiosis or a gut infection or some sort of something going on in your gut. And that can also create some histamine issues, but they're not necessarily the same thing. So the person who's like, I have so many food sensitivities. I'm sensitive to lots of chemicals. You may have some histamine issues going on as like a secondary layer for that. 
but they're not, they don't have to be the same thing. It, it gets really confusing. And I think too, there's not a straightforward test. I talked about using like the histamine, the low histamine diet as a test. You, you know, you can check Dow enzyme in your blood. You can check histamine in your blood. You can check something called tryptase, which is released when you release histamine, but they're pretty, especially Dow seems to be when you test that in the blood inconsistent. So people are not sure if that's really a reliable test or not. And it seems like the histamine testing should really be done by a specialty lab. So if we're going to look into that, we'd really probably want to send you to like a mast cell specialist. But if you get better coming off of those foods, then we want to be like thinking, okay, you've got this histamine intolerance. Where do we need to support you? Clear an infection, support those enzymes. Look at what's driving that. Got it. Okay. So since you just mentioned it, and because we talked about talking about it maybe 15 minutes ago, can we talk about mast cell stabilizers and just mast cell in general and how that's different from histamine intolerance or histamine buildup? Yeah. So you might be releasing more histamine, like again, from a gut bug, or you might be eating more histamine. And if you decrease that, you're okay. Or you support those enzymes and you're to clear it out and you're okay. Um, other people do have overactive mast cells. This is your allergic person, or this is someone with mast cell activation. So what I like to do when you're kind of looking at what do I need to do for a person, if someone comes in and they're just like totally miserable, like they're so itchy and I think there's histamine stuff going on. It's fine to take natural mast cell stabilizers, vitamin C, quercetin. We've got a lot of these. Um, so you can take those things to kind of help calm things down while we're working on an underlying cause. Sometimes we need to do that. Again, sometimes people just stop eating the sauerkraut every day and they're like, I feel pretty much fine now. So it kind of depends on where you're at, but we do have a lot of natural things that stabilize mast cells. Now, if you're someone who has allergies, like how does this histamine intolerance play into you? Again, you might be someone who is fine the whole rest of the year, but during allergy season, you've got, now this is more of that allergy and that mast cell activation. You've got a reaction to all this like pollen or something that's going on during that time, you're just overall in a higher histamine burden. So a lower histamine diet during your worst time can be really helpful. And you would probably feel like you had an alleviation of some of those symptoms, but you may not need to do that like the rest of the year. And those people sometimes need to take, you know, medication. Sometimes they can do like the natural mast cell stablers again, like quercetin is a great one. So it's vitamin C and that can really help during that time. Now, if you are someone with mast cell activation, which is a little bit different, you either make too many mast cells or yours are too touchy. And remember again, mast cells are the cells that hold the histamine. So they're going to release it. So this is the same thing as mast cell activation syndrome, right? Yeah. The, the AS. MCAS is sometimes what it's called. So that's like the most extreme version of what we're talking about. And that you're going to probably feel a little bit better by decreasing some of the histamine foods. But with these guys, like we do all that stuff and they're not better because it's just, they have such touchy mast cells or they've overall just have such an overburdened immune system that their tolerance to everything. There's this idea in, um, in an immunology called tolerance. Like we should be able to tolerate ourselves and to some degree tolerate food and our environment and the things we come in contact with and just respond to that bacteria or that virus or those things that um, we shouldn't be like allergic to a tree. We shouldn't be allergic to food, but you know, again, we lose some tolerance, some of us. For mast cell activation people, again, sometimes I think in the natural world, if you're looking at this on experts on Instagram and stuff, there's a lot of conversation about these being the same thing. And they're really not. Mast cell activation is its own diagnosis. You have to meet certain criteria for it. Like one of which being you have to have histamine related symptoms in multiple organ systems. I think there has to at least be two. So you'd have to have the GI stuff plus the anxiety or agitation or, you know, you'd have to have it across some systems. It will get better taking antihistamines. That's another thing. If you are somebody that has mast cell activation and you take Zyrtec or something like that, you should feel better. And sometimes with this population, Functional medicine will do a really good job with a lot of the pieces, but sometimes they still need medications. Like I was just about to say, cause I, that's usually what people ask me about with regard to histamine is I don't want to be on a medication every time I have a symptom or to make sure my symptoms don't come or just indefinitely, uh, whether that's prescription or not, or they're thinking about getting pregnant and they're worried about, you know, being on and have, you know, prescription antihistamine for that. Yeah. So I don't really know what to tell people about that. So I would say first, you probably don't know, right? Like you don't know if you just have histamine intolerance, which you can deal with in a number of ways, right? We can 
lower the histamines in your diet. We can look for all those root causes and resolve. I mean, we can treat SIBO. We can treat dysbiosis. We can improve your liver detoxification. We can give you B vitamins. So can we sort it out? Like, can we get to the root cause, whether that's supporting those enzymes, supporting what, you know, you might be deficient in genetically. Can we clean up your diet and lifestyle? You know, a lot of us are doing things, you know, stress is higher histamine because it's inflammatory. So are you sleeping? Like I can tell immediately that's what happens to me when I don't sleep. I'm just so puffy. Um, so that's like part of my histamine stuff. So there's a lot of it we can try to clean up. So if we can get to your root cause and get you like having a healthy gut and have a healthy liver detoxification and maybe supporting some of those enzymes, maybe you'll be fine. I mean, I don't feel like histamine is something I deal with on a daily basis. Now I'm just sort of mindful in the back of my mind, like not to do tomatoes and avocados and spinach in one day, or I will pay the price for that the next day. Um, but for the most part, it's okay. Right. So if that's you, then we can do all of that. And then if you're somebody who's like, well, it's just these certain times a year when I'm in certain environments, then maybe you take some vitamin C and quercetin during those times. And if you've done all that and we've looked at your testing and we've, and you're still really struggling, or you're somebody who just can't take anything, like every supplement I give you <laughs> causes a reaction then we're going to be probably wanting to like have someone evaluate you more thoroughly for mast cell activation. So I would say mast cell activation is something that's going to need some long-term support, whether it's a prescription an over-the-counter antihistamine or some natural antihistamines, the histamine intolerance you can get on top of. Again, it gets very confusing because they start eliminating these foods and they feel better. And then they don't, and they don't understand that, that bucket analogy. And we talked a little bit about female hormones, and this is something I want to make sure we touch on too. So your placenta will make a ton of Dow enzymes. So progesterone is enhancing that, that enzyme that helps you break down histamine. So some women find when I was pregnant, I could eat whatever I want. When I was pregnant, my, you know, these other issues went away or I didn't have allergies. So progesterone sort of supportive for better histamine balance, whereas estrogen decreases your Dow enzyme. So some women get those menstrual migraines or everything gets worse, their fatigue, their allergies, their headaches, um, maybe some of their GI stuff, their sleep gets bad around ovulation. So those times when your estrogen is highest. So as you ovulate, you're going to have the most estrogen. So if you're somebody who gets a headache, I didn't mention headaches and migraines, but those are another big um, histamine symptom. If your stuff just flares around ovulation or maybe the end of your cycle, and there's another little bump up in estrogen. And sometimes that's where if you don't have great estrogen detoxification, you'll have more estrogen related symptoms then. So if that's you, some of my patients just avoid those histamine foods 48 hours before ovulation and they don't get their migraine. So sometimes you can use that like a tool that way too, that they don't have to live that way. But if they try to just be really mindful of those foods during the time when their estrogen is the highest that, cause that would be one of their potential triggers as well. So you mentioned natural antihistamines. What are those exactly, if not, you know, dietary and, and lifestyle changes and some of the supplements and minerals you talked about? So that's what I meant about the, the it would be like the quercetin and the vitamin C or any sort of. Histamine. Oh, I see. Okay. And there's other herbs like trifala and mangosteen extract. So there's, they tend to be in like that antioxidant variety, but quercetin and vitamin C are probably like the bigger stars. If you look at any allergy supplement, it's going to have quercetin and vitamin C in it. Got it. Okay. Um, so we talked about how there are ways to reverse histamine intolerance simply by understanding what you're doing, their behavior, if you're eating high histamine foods, um, and also looking at the root causes that are causing a histamine reaction, possibly like SIBO, Lyme, H. pylori, these other things, stress even, you know, it, it's really very similar to inflammation in general, right? Yeah. Anything that, or, or when you're talking about the antihistamine diet, it's so similar to the anti-inflammatory diet where it removes certain things that normally are super healthy foods. And I have to explain to people that say, but I thought, you know, avocado is really good for you. Or how could you remove nuts? Nuts are, you know, such a great source of plant-based protein. And, and I said, I know, and, and, and a normal diet and a normal digestive system needs those. And it's not a long-term thing, right? Nobody should be on an antihistamine or, or a full, really intense anti-inflammatory diet forever. But sometimes these things, when you have too much of them, um, are causing this reaction, especially if you have compromised detox pathways or lack the enzymes or have these genetic issues related to those enzymes. Um, so you can reverse histamine intolerance by looking, you know, further upstream. It sounds like 
it's hard to reverse mast cell activation syndrome. Yeah. And you never want to say never, right? Like there's a lot, we're still learning and understanding and, you know, people are amazing and your body is pretty cool at some of the stuff it can, it can sort out, but sometimes that means you have to be on top of it more. Like PCOS is a good example. Like I don't feel like on a daily basis, I suffer with my PCOS, but I certainly would if I ate a standard American diet or didn't care how I slept or, you know, there's a lot of in my stress management. Like I, that would turn like, I don't know if I want to call it like in remission, but like I do a lot of things in my diet and lifestyle and some certain supplements and the way that I eat and the way that I exercise to keep that great. Like I have a cycle every month. I got pregnant easy, but that was because I did those things. So I think sometimes we have this idea that if I turn to natural medicine, if I turn to functional medicine, I'll cure this, this will just be gone. And I think that's actually a real disservice that my profession has done in marketing to people to get you to come see us as a practitioner that I'm going to cure your Hashimoto's. I'm going to cure your MS. I'm going to, and I think that what it is, is we have great tools to remove so many of the things that aggravate your hormones, that aggravate your digestion, that aggravate your immune system. And if you continue to do those things, you hopefully are going to be in a really great place. You know, sometimes you start working with someone and they're like, I was taking a lot of supplements because we did seven things for my gut to get this under control quickly. And then we worked on some things for my hormones. And now I take two probiotics and my multivitamin and maybe one other thing and I'm fine. You know, so I think sometimes it's an intense kind of healing part of the thing, but I think there is something to be said about whether it's with a nutrient or a supplement or certain diet and lifestyle modifications that will keep whatever that condition was at bay. I feel like we've done a little bit of a disservice and also this idea of a root cause. I love that idea, but I think, you know, people come to me and they're like, what's my root cause? And I always say at this point, it's compound causes. You have yeah, I very, um, like you said, I've very rarely seen one root cause of anything. Yeah. I mean, that's like magical if that happens. Love it's like, that. oh, that's so <laughs> easy. But that's never the case, especially private clients and stuff that have chronic Lyme or something like that. I'm like, nobody has chronic Lyme that doesn't have a handful of other really serious things. Yeah. Um, it's just impossible. Your body would have, you know, overcome the Lyme bacteria already if it was operating at its best, but it's compromised in some way that's making it, you know, and then when we keep digging, it's like, oh, there, there's a mold issue. There's celiac, there's, you know, these other things that are making it so compromised that the Lyme continues to, to wreak havoc. And I really like that you mentioned that because there is a huge difference between completely resolving something and putting it into remission. And Mm -hmm. even I, you know, talk about fully healing something. But when I talk about fully healing something, to me, it's that you don't experience those symptoms anymore. Does it mean that those things that help you stop experiencing those symptoms, you can totally stop doing and go back to fully eating junk food and never drinking (laughs) water and this and that? No. And that's, you know, if if I've ever made it seem that way, I I apologize. And I (laughs) think marketing usually uses a few words, right? And so um, people pull out the ones that they want to hear that the most promising, but, um, you know, you can, you can fully resolve H pylori by making that yeah. fully go away. Right. right. You, but fully resolving a thyroid condition without continuing to do the things that help you to put that thyroid, those thyroid symptoms into remission or make them go away. Yeah. No. Part of what we want to remember too, is like, yeah, maybe I have to take a couple nutrients for my PCOS and there's foods that just don't work for me or, um, but I would say two girls can go gluten-free and they both feel physically amazing. One feels like I feel so empowered that I have this knowledge that if I do X, Y, and Z and avoid this food, I feel so much better and I can live my life. And I, you know, my body feels and looks the way that I want it to, you know, and I sleep and I just, I can do my life and I can feel great. And someone else can go, and I'm using gluten as just an example. Someone else goes gluten-free, their physical symptoms go away and they feel restricted and miserable and just hate every second of it. And you know, that A is not sustainable. You know, that person's not going to be successful on it. And also like, is it the same level of healthy as the other person going gluten-free when it causes so much emotional stress? And so, so much of that, I think just comes down to mindset, which how am I going to look at that? If I know that I've uncovered these things and maybe we've cleared some of them entirely, and then I can do these couple of vitamins and these lifestyle things and this nutrition plan, and then I can experience better health, that's either going to feel really good or it's going to feel like bad. And it's really just in how we, in how we look at it. 
I end up getting to mindset in pretty much every interview <laughs> I've ever done, whether yeah. it's very technical about something um, that has nothing to do with mental, emotional, spiritual health, or something that's very related to it. And the answer is it plays a huge role in every single organ function and system. And every expert, including yourself, mentions it because we take cues, right? Like to move your arm, your arm has to take the cue from the brain to do that, to uh, pass gas, right? Your digestive system, your your colon, and it takes cues from from your brain. And so, when your brain is quite negative, or or thinking something is hard, or that the, you know, woe is me for having to avoid gluten, or why did these things happen to me, or um, I'm so fat, and you know, I'm not worthy of good health, and this and that. All of the systems and organs in your body are like well, God, this is a depressing environment. Like we're, yeah. we're not going to work well. And so um, I've seen this come up in every possible healing situation. And yeah. um, the positive energy not only helps you keep going when you stumble, but it sends messages to everywhere else to yeah. function better. And we know that. I mean, you don't have to understand the biochemistry of it to do it. You know it in your own life. You're like, yeah, when I feel good, it's easier to make the salad and it's easier to get my workout in and it's easier to take care of myself and all of those things. And everything feels a little bit better. But we know like when you're happy, when you laugh, when you are with people that you love and you release oxytocin and you release these opioids that actually impact an immune cell, we know exactly how those feel good chemicals regulate a T cell in your immune system. So the patients that come to me with, especially like with autoimmunity and stuff, the ones that do best are, are the ones that are finding ways to be joyful. And maybe that's not how it starts, but that's, you know, a huge piece of it. The ones that are in a terrible relationship that hate their job, that, you know, just can't, they're in these Facebook groups where everyone's just commiserating about how awful it is to have whatever it's bad. It's like those people just can't get better and we can do all this stuff, but they have this, this constant activation of their immune system by, you know, and it, it's funny because it sounds like kind of woo woo, but we know that now, like we can measure <laughs> what happens when you laugh to your T cells. Like that's, we know that this is helpful. And I, I never thought I would talk about this because I think I saw myself as a little more scientific and it's funny, like writing hangry, Sarah Fragoso is my co-author for Hangry. And when we were writing that, we had all the pieces. We knew what to tell people to eat. We had this great strength training template and this great workout plan. And we have, you know, we talk about histamine and all these different things that impact your hormones that you might want to be thinking about. But we're like, this is what we talk about with women every day. Like that takes a little bit of time. It's the, what makes you happy? What are you doing every day? That's just fun. That's finding joy. And it became this huge foundation of that program that started off. Cause we're like, yeah, this book is, you know, great, but this is just the women we talk to. This is just such a piece of what they really need to be thinking about. Most women, and I work with women. I know that's not the only person listening, but you know, with women, especially we find they know exactly what their partner likes, what their kids like, what their boss likes. And they're like, I don't even know what makes me happy or what, you know, because we're especially in the COVID <laughs> world where it's sort of yeah. like, work and then Netflix, really, you're like, what did I do? for <laughs> You yeah. know, like what, what were those things that if I had nothing to do today, I would do. And a lot of people have completely forgotten. And we don't uh, value it. Like we value the hustle. We value the work. We value the end product, the money. Right. The or feel guilty because doing those things make them feel somehow unproductive or, yeah. or they're just defaulting to the, you know, path of least resistance where they think they want to just sit and watch TV all the time. Yeah or scroll on social media, but that's not really bringing them joy in the way that, you know, some sort of activity that sparks their creative interest or um, something else could, could do. But like you said, it's, it's culturally not encouraged. No, like in, you know, we talked about like doing something every day that cannot be undone. If you think about the things you don't do that are work or taking care of your family, what do you do? You do the dishes, you make your bed, you do your laundry, you clean up your yard. Like you do all this stuff that is rapidly getting undone, right? Cause you're going to have to do it again tomorrow. Like painting, playing a game with your kids, uh, playing an instrument, um, making a memory, having a conversation. Like those are things you can't undo. And we really talked a lot about like, do some of those every day, like just something that you just do because it felt good because it, you know, made a connection with someone. Um, and we just, that is so something I will do that if I have time, that is not bubble up to the top of our priority list. And it's more than just a good idea. It really is so fundamental to our health. 
I couldn't agree more. Okay. I do want to make sure before we wrap up that some people who at this point are thinking, I think I have either histamine intolerance, histamine buildup, mast cell activation syndrome have next steps they feel good about and don't just feel like this is something that's going to be um, a drain on them or hard to resolve or put into remission. So if somebody believes they have one of those things, um, what are the next best steps to take? Again, I think going on a low histamine diet is a really good way for you to get some pretty quick feedback within a couple of weeks of like, yeah, this feels definitely different. And I can give you guys a download. I have a guide for um, histamine that, with recipes and stuff just to kind of again get on that plan and see what happens. If you really feel like I see myself in that guide or you see myself in, in an article, you know, reach out to somebody and start to again try to get to some of those root causes. And some people find that low histamine diet and they're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better and my skin's clear and I can sleep and all this stuff and my breast tenderness is gone and my digestion's good. I will just stay here because I don't have to pay to work with someone. I don't don't have to, you know, but again, that's a very restrictive diet and it doesn't get to any of your root causes. It just decreases the flow into the bucket. Diversity in your plant foods. Like if there's anything I can tell you guys, as far as like what keeps us healthier, your immune system, your gut, you need to be eating a large array of plant fibers. And if you're on this really restrictive diet for histamine or anything else, your gut microbiome will suffer. And we can nudge it with lots of probiotics and products and stuff, but ultimately we want to be getting more of that stuff from food. So we really do need to get to that root cause. That's one of the uh, most popular well-be podcasts and you know uh, YouTube uh, interviews is with a uh, Dr. Will Bolswick, who is called the Fiber Doc, and it's all oh. about um, how plant diversity and diversity in your diet is really the answer to great gut health. But one of the challenges in the interview was really understanding, like when you eat black beans, for example, and immediately feel a symptom, you know there's a part of your mind that thinks, well, I shouldn't eat that. But then, you know, for how long, when you take that fully away, those good bacteria in your gut that need black beans or need legumes to live die. Right. And you don't want that, but how do you, you know, marry this world between like, I can clearly see I have a bad reaction to that food with, okay, well, I want a strong gut. So I need a lot of diversity. And that's right. It sounds like histamine comes in and that could be sort of the difference is that if you can, clear up the histamine buildup or solve histamine intolerance, then yeah. some of these reactions you might be having to, and like you said, it's not like you break out in hives, but you just feel some digestive discomfort or, you know, runny nose or something like that could clear up. And then you could continue to eat um, a great diversity of plants. So is that kind of, well, I think a couple things. So I think, you know, there's a lot of reason someone might be on a restrictive diet, right? It might be I'm on the histamine diet or I'm on the low FODMAP diet, or I'm on, I mean, I don't consider paleo a super restricted. Some people do, but I consider that it's got pretty good diversity. You're not eating certain things, but you're getting a lot of other things. Um, so you might be on some variation of that or the autoimmune paleo or where, wherever you're at. Um, so you want to do your best you can within that. Also like try to solve as many issues that cause you to be overreactive to food, gut infections, leaky gut is, you know, component of that, or just an inappropriate immune response to food, or you might have like histamine intolerance, but whatever is causing you to have a really restrictive diet, can we resolve it so that you tolerate more foods? That's always the goal, like to get you to just a, not be on such a tightrope with your diet. Like that's not super fun to live, but also it tells us that with the underlying, if you're tolerant, not tolerant to very many foods, your immune system's not great, right? I know we need to work on that. Your gut's probably not great. So we want to get past that so that you can a have a, just a easier time <laughs> living your life, but also then you can eat more diverse plant foods. But sometimes that's a therapeutic tool that we have to have you be now, obviously like gluten intolerance or celiac or something like that might is a whole different conversation, right? That's food's just going to be gone. But if it's that you can't eat spinach and strawberries and avocados, be, maybe we need to restore store balance so that you can. And while you're doing that, then you want to be as diverse with the foods that you do have, right? So you don't want to be eating chicken and, chicken and broccoli every day. We want to be rotating your proteins and eating from the foods that you can eat, keep it as diverse as possible. And then again, work hopefully with someone or really get like good probiotics in there so that you're at least, you know, doing and the short chain fatty acids, you're at least taking some of the supplements that you can't get from your diet right now. Hopefully you won't need those in time. And there's a lot of ways to improve that diversity. I mean, you can 
pulverize all of your veggies in a powder and put them in the freezer. And then you take a spoonful of that every day. Cause some people are like, I'm just too busy to think about plant diversity in my day. Like there's ways around it. You just got to be a little bit more diligent. Yes. I wish I could put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> um, so if someone does an antihistamine diet and still is struggling with some different issues and thinks maybe they have a mast cell issue, um, what sort of practitioner uh, is is the best person to really, you know, who, who has an equal amount of knowledge on this topic as you do? Because conventional physicians I've seen for the most part um, can, can identify those issues and put you on an antihistamine mm-hmm. um, or a mast cell stabilizer drug, but that's sort of the extent of it. So what, what sort of specialty will have uh, more training in these other ways to approach? Uh, well, I think that's where you're looking for your functional medicine doctor to really take that broad look at, you know, let's start with those foundations of health with your gut health. And is there any, you know, those chronic infections, your inflammatory status, your immune balance, your blood sugar. I mean, I'm like the queen of talking about blood sugar. It's like the most boring thing. People are like, really? We're still talking. And I'm like, yeah, because it still matters that much and it drives everything else. So I know it's a huge issue for hormonal balance, blood sugar. Yeah. And neurotransmitter, but everything, right? So, and it creates inflammation and oxidative stress and it plays into histamine too. Like someone might be doing the low histamine diet, but their blood sugar is a mess and they're still not feeling quite better. So I think a functional medicine doctor is going to be really good at getting your basics in line. If you think you have histamine issues, I would certainly talk to your functional medicine doctor about how much do you know about that? Because it's not something that everybody does. But if I have a patient that I think has mast cell activation, I would still send them to an allergist, someone who's a specialist in mast cell activation, and then you can work together. I think so often people feel like I have to choose between I'm going to do functional medicine and natural medicine, or I have to choose between my, that and my medication. And sometimes the best choice for that patient is a blend of both. You right. know, I think that there's always sure going to be a conventional physician is willing to work with yeah somebody else. That's a, that's a huge piece of it. It's like, well, no, I've got this conventional physician, totally not open-minded or not interested in working with other people, but I'm trying to like now force this relationship. Um, No, then you want to find a different specialist. You want to find, I think you want to find your functional and alternative medicine doctor that is not like, no, you can't ever do conventional medicine. And you want to find at the very least that your conventional doctor is at least open to learning more about, and that they're, if they don't know anything about it, and if they just don't know about like, I mean, at this point, like the microbiome, I mean, this is becoming a more of a converse, a part of the conversation in conventional medicine too, which is great. Um, I think that things are changing a little bit, probably because patients are demanding it, right? You're going to go to a different doctor if your doctor is not seeing your point of view at all. But I, I think it's important to find someone on the conventional side that at the very least is like, I'm willing to look into that more. I'm willing to have a conversation with your functional medicine physician and let's talk about what's best for you. Um, What you don't want to hear is like, well, that's stupid or um, that's a waste of your money. Because if you're hopefully going to a functional medicine doctor that's not having you do anything that's not backed by not only some research, but their clinical experience. I mean, especially with histamine, we're still learning about this and we're still trying to understand the difference between histamine intolerance and mast cell activation. Where's the overlap and where do these patients that are just super sensitive, like where do they kind of fit in all of this? Is it just histamine intolerance? So we're still learning, but someone who's, you know, again, has some clinical experience with, this is what I found to really help with my patients, which matters, even if there's not a research paper to back that up. If someone's found like this consistently improves my outcomes, because we're still, we're still learning. Yeah. So I like your suggestion of starting with, if somebody suspects they have these issues, uh, an antihistamine diet, and then moving into getting some more uh, professional help if they, you know, regardless of the outcome, they may just feel they need to go to that step. But what have you seen um, if somebody's following an antihistamine diet, uh, the timeline, how long did they, before they start to see some relief? So if you just have histamine intolerance, you should feel some relief from that diet fairly quickly, like within a couple of weeks, you may not be completely better, but you shouldn't like your congestion went away, or you haven't had a headache in a week, or your digestion feels more stable, you should start to see some improvement, or maybe you did it for a month. And you're like, "Hmm, that cycle, I didn't have any breast tenderness like that, you would notice that or um, maybe you would notice your 
cycle was just not very painful, um, less clotting, less cramps. Sometimes it'll impact that too. Or maybe it was right on time, whereas it had been a little bit all over the place. So if you're someone who's like, my main thing is my FPCOS and my cycle can be late and I can have all these and I can break out, but that cycle skin was great cycle was on time, you know, you kind of look at what are your main symptoms and you want to see those resolve. So with the cycle, it's always a little longer. You always have to wait probably a minimum of, you know, three to four weeks, right. To see what's going to happen, but your digestion and, you know, your anxiety, like I know, like my sleep was better in like two days. Like I slept better. It was noticeable. My skin was better in a week. So I think that you should start to see some, some resolution and improvement to let you know you're on the right track. Now, if I have a patient that I sent home with a low histamine plan, come back in three weeks and they're like, I'm exactly the same. I'm like, then this is not worth the restriction. We need to look at other, at other things. But, um, if your burden is so, so high, <clears throat> now again, like what are all going on in your world? Do you have mold in your home? Are you super stressed out? We do your stool test and you've got six different gut bugs in there. You might not feel better in two weeks because you have so many things that are just on your system, those compound causes, right? So, but most people go low histamine for a couple of weeks. If you start to see some improvement, you'd want to look at like, well, where are my root causes. Now, someone with mast cell activation is not going to feel that much better on a couple of weeks off these because they've got uh, so many other triggers that their immune system is just so reactive. But histamine intolerance, which I think is what a lot of us are probably dealing with, um, or even maybe a mild mast cell activation, I think there might be degrees of that too, that we're starting to understand is going to feel better, at least some somewhat better in just a couple of weeks, which is good because then you know you're on the right track. And that's always encouraging to keep going and to see if you can get to some root causes that would kind of eliminate that need for you to be on that diet. Yeah. And that seems to be the timeline for all elimination diets, as I've seen, like a, you know, phase out timeline of about three weeks or so. And then depending on how many things you reintroduce, it's, yeah. you know, one, two, three weeks. Um, but there's that, you know, three to four weeks where if there was something in here causing you issues, you would begin to see a difference, feel better, et cetera. And probably the you... only caveat to that is if your gut is such a mess, it might not be right. And then you put them in and all the stuff comes, comes back. So. Yes. Like the people that have done like a whole 30, right. They did the whole 30 and they didn't get better. And it's like, well, then we just, the food wasn't the only thing that's aggravating all that. It helps. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I have a friend who she has chronic Lyme and some mold issues and celiac and, and she's aware of that, but she, did a pretty strict elimination diet and she could definitely tell that certain foods made her feel worse. So it was good to keep those out, but certainly mm -hmm. some of the issues remained because there were so many other things going on. Yeah. Um, so it was helpful in that like, okay, in order to just tackle the chronic Lyme and the mold issues and work on all that, I do have to keep gluten and dairy out of my diet, but yeah. that's not the only issues. Now we got to move on to the next step. So it's kind of, it's a layering approach to healing. Um, Cause like you couldn't even see these sort of lime driven or mold driven symptoms alone, unless you got rid of this issue with gluten and dairy first. Um, yeah. So that and is that's the multiple time a day, right? The food is so powerful because we eat it several times a day, right? Like, it's, right. I think yeah. of it like um, trying to get out of the surf and like the wave yeah. keeps knocking, knocking you down. Like this <laughs> yeah. is each meal is like, if you're eating things that your body's like, please no. And you keep yeah. knocking it down. It's like really hard to just get out of the water. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I uh, like to use that analogy. You are just a wealth of knowledge on this topic. And I knew so little and I feel like I know so much more now. And I could ask you about 600 more questions, but <laughs> just in the interest of your busy day and time, is there anything that people should really know about histamine intolerance, histamine burden, uh, or, you know, eating too much of it, or I guess it's called histamine buildup and then mass cell activation that we haven't already talked about that you think is important? I think we covered a lot of the biggies. I mean, I think it's, you know, if you have multiple symptoms in lots of different areas, you always want to look at your immune system, whether that's chronic regular based inflammation or histamine based inflammation. So if you've got lots of symptoms, sometimes histamine, again, is kind of the thing that ties it up in a bow and will get you some relief across the board while we look for the underlying, you know, causes. Again, it's worth exploring. If you've tried a lot of stuff and you've worked with some people and you've done a bunch of things and you're just still just not quite there and you haven't explored this. Um, and again, it's so much more common now because we have so many things that disrupt our gut. We have so many things that burden our detox and we have so many things that make our immune system agitated these days. It's just, we live in a, 
a really modern world that has a lot of stuff for us to deal with. And, you know, I think it's hard sometimes when you're the more sensitive person, you know, and you're like, well, my friends can eat like whatever they want and stuff. You know, we all have those, again, like kind of genetic susceptibilities to those things. And, you know, some of us are going to have more of these issues than others. You know, two people can live in mold infested houses and one is fine because their immune system and their liver just gets rid of it and someone else, their life just falls apart. Right. So yeah, I was going to say genetic or just, um, sort of life experience driven too, right. If someone's a C-section birth, we were not breastfed at all, or, uh, took a lot of antibiotics as a small child. We know their immune system is going to be different from somebody who didn't do any of that. Right. I mean, my grandparents were farmers, which was really helpful. I think for me, (laughs) as far as my microbiome, because there was a lot of dirt, um, because my kids aren't getting that at all living in a suburban area. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And before that an urban area, well, this has just been such a pleasure. My last question for you, or it's a two-part question is, uh, we ask all the experts that we have on the show, um, how do you get well be quote unquote, because that's our website and all of our social channels and, you know, hashtag we use. And, and the idea of that is that, you know, wellness or well-being and and good health, it doesn't just happen. It's an active process, as you talked about. So you really have to get well-be and and continue to put effort into it, just like anything worthwhile. Um, So what do you do every day that you absolutely won't miss that, that helps you to, you know, hashtag get well-be? I get well be by keeping moving. So between just my own like stress management and um, having insulin resistance and PCOS, like I at least make sure I walk every day. I do strength train. Um, I do. So that is something that um, I do kind of like it. So that's easy for me, but I also, it's been something I've just put into place for so long. Cause it was something that really changed everything for, for my hormones. So that is something I don't struggle with. Um, as I've gotten a little bit older into my mid forties now, um, my sleep, I have to do everything, um, starting in the morning. I have to make sure that I'm getting the right light exposure throughout the day. Like you know, in the morning versus the night, I have to balance my blood sugar. I have to manage my stress throughout the day in addition to the stuff I do right before bed, but I really prioritize my sleep. And that is not something that I used to do. Like so many people running myself ragged for so long. Um, so now as far as my well being, this sleep is probably the one thing that I will put a lot of stuff in place to do. And I certainly have some of those other ones that, um, I struggle with. I'm one of the people who just doesn't drink water unless I'm actively like on that mission. I look at all the stuff I do every day to take care of myself. Water should be relatively easy, but that's my thing. That's my one. I have to, we all to. struggle. We all <laughs> that's struggle my one. With some component of, you know, <laughs> yeah. what it takes, um, to stay really well. And I, I like to think of it as just a constant reminder that you're never done, never um, done. Yeah. that you're never perfect, that you can always improve because even the people that have all the information and live it and breathe it like we do, there's always, you know, one of those five core components of yeah. well-being that's a challenge, or maybe it's two or whatever, but yeah. um, we can continue to improve and it's humbling, which is good. And I would say the other, the one other thing that I feel is so important to, uh, for me to get well be is to um, start my morning with a little bit of an intention, like not just get up and get on my phone and start taking care of the kids, but to get up before everybody and take at least five minutes for myself to work on my mindset, to work on like the stuff going on um, that I need to tend to in like my psyche. Um, if I do that every day, everything is much, much easier. <laughs> I agree. My day is completely different. If I just check in with myself in the morning, Um, I like to do it on my morning walk and just, I actually talk out loud to myself. It's the only way to kind of stop the other thoughts, you know, because you can have so many different thoughts going at once in your brain um, at the same time. But if you're speaking out loud, it's much more focused thought because you have to speak and think at the same time. Yeah. I call it my mantra walk. If you follow me on social media, I'm always talking on my mantra walk. Like that is my time to like, I could listen to a podcast. I can do some of those things, but I need to take at least five minutes of that time to work on what I'm thinking and how I'm feeling. Yeah. I love that. Um, and it's good to know that we all are struggling with different components of yeah. uh, basic well-being, like drinking water and yeah. exercise. <laughs> That's that so hard for me. Well, Dr. Brooke, tell us where to find you in a normal, you know, virtual world. Yes. Um, well, my practice is actually entirely virtual. So I do, that's uh, my home on the web is betterbydrbrook.com. My podcast was the Sarah and Dr. Brooke show. It's just me now. So it is the Dr. Brooke show. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. Um, 
on social media, um, on Instagram, Facebook is the only places I am. It's Better by Dr. Brooke. And Hangry is the book that Sarah and I wrote um, that came out a year and a half ago. It's hard to believe it was that long ago. Um, but uh, Hangry is a full hormone program with, we talk about like the hierarchy of making sure you deal with your more delicate hormone issues and then move on down the road because women have so many hormones going on and we tend to just think about estrogen and progesterone. So it's a really thorough step-by-step -step program that I'm really proud of and that you can find and it's called Hangry wherever, wherever books are sold. Awesome. I think plenty of people listening to this either who are just interested in um, hormonal improvement or hormonal balancing or dealing with this histamine issue could benefit from uh interacting with you in all the places. So uh, thank you again for being on the show and uh, have a lovely day. Thank you. You too.